Welcome to the continuation of the 2020 National Coastal Estuarian Summit, the virtual edition. This is Skin Current Session 2, Track 2. Our session is Blue Carbon Implementation, Progress and Barriers. My name is Megan Eagle. I'm a research scientist at the US Geological Survey. Today we're going to look at blue carbon, which is the uptake of atmospheric CO2 by coastal wetlands and subsequent long-term storage in anoxic water inundated peat. This is one of many ecosystem services that coastal wetlands provide, some of which are shown here. This ecosystem service relies on the unique biogeochemical cycles that occur in coastal wetlands that allow for large amounts of carbon to be stored for long periods of time. However, coastal wetlands exist at the nexus of people and hazards associated with people living on the coast and climate resilience. Anytime people um, interact with a coastal area, they try to manage their hazards. Um, as a result, uh, close to 2 million acres of wetland in the continental U.S. exist in either a drained or an impounded state. Those management actions have consequences for the carbon sequestration in coastal wetlands um, and can change the carbon cycling um, in natural wetlands, which ultimately cool the climate to um, situ uh, conditions that favor warming. Um, and that's either through the release of stored carbon in, back to the atmosphere or uh, increases in methane production in coastal wetlands due to management. Um, so blue carbon itself is at this intersection of wetland management and climate resilience. Um, I mentioned it's one of the many co-benefits, so there's many reasons that wetlands are managed and blue carbon should be considered as one of those. Um, recent work has shown that um, it is a potential natural climate solution and should be integrated into strategies to meet greenhouse gas reduction and emission targets. Um, in addition, there is a voluntary carbon market that blue carbon projects can participate in as a potential avenue for monetization. Progress is needed across science, management, and policy to implement blue carbon um, uh, within this context. Our session today is going to explore those various um, frontiers. We're going to start at the site scale, um, looking at a presentation from Tim Smith at the Cape Cod National Seashore, looking at a specific project. We'll look at state scales as Mattia Yepsen um, from the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection tells us her state's perspective. And finally, we'll move on to larger scales. Um, the, uh, Tana Marie Surgeon Rogers is going to give us a perspective from the National Estuarine Research Reserve System. Jim Holmquist at Smithsonian Environmental Research Center will talk about mapping advances for coastal wetlands um, and the climate consequences of those. And finally, Kevin Kroger at USGS will wrap up looking at blue carbon implementation within emission reduction programs. At the conclusion of these oral sessions, which are recorded, there will be a live Q&A session. So please come and um, talk to us after you see these talks. Thank you for joining me for this presentation today, where I'll be looking at the National Estuarine Research Reserves on the front lines of advancing blue carbon science and application. My name is Tana Marie Surgeon Rogers, and I am the director at the Wakoit Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve based in Massachusetts. I'll be talking about the work of the reserve system over the past decade or so, and just quickly summarizing highlights from that work, um, some factors that have contributed to success, I believe, as well as some of the challenges that have been encountered, and some a few lessons that could be noteworthy for others who are working on this um, subject area, or even they may be applicable to other areas of coastal management as well. I'd like to start out with just a very brief introduction to the National Estuarine Research Reserve System that we refer to as NERS for short. And so research reserves represent a network of 29 protected coastal and estuarine areas around the country. They are set aside to support long-term research and monitoring, to be active in education about the health of these areas and impacts to them, and also to work with partners on being great coastal stewards and demonstrating coastal stewardship practices and training others to become coastal stewards as well. Since we're talking about blue carbon, I want to pick up the story of the NERS in 2010, when through a project called Bringing Wetlands to Market, 
there began to be more concentrated focus and better understanding carbon sequestration and carbon storage in tidal wetlands, the role that plays in climate mitigation, and then capitalizing on that to help to incentivize investment in coastal restoration and coastal conservation using carbon markets as an avenue to do that. This work was supported by the Neuroscience Collaborative, a funding um, entity that um, gets funding from the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration and supports the work of reserves in the community at large to work with academic and community partners to address coastal management problems and to really do applied science. And so I'm gonna pick up the story with bringing wetlands to market in Massachusetts that um, started to help to bolster um, understanding about a number of different um, parameters related to blue carbon in tidal wetlands, and then blossomed out from there to taking that learning to others um, within the nervous system and also partners that were involved in the project working on their own with other collaborators as well. Today, if you look within the research reserve system and you ask the question, what is happening on blue carbon? Who is doing what? Where are projects happening? What are these projects focused on? And what are we learning from that body of work? Captured here in this graphic on the slide is a, um, a map that was produced by the Neuroscience Collaborative showing um, the range of projects that they have funded over the past decades or so, decade or so on blue carbon and the different areas, thematic areas, I would say that these projects are addressing. I think this gives a really good picture of the type of end-to-end -end work that reserves are doing. And also I'd like to point out that there may be other projects and there are other projects happening within the reserve system that are not captured here because they weren't explicitly funded by the Science Collaborative. But nevertheless, they re represent um, very active um, areas of blue carbon research. And I, was, I also think it's interesting to know that when we started bringing wetlands to market, there were just a handful of projects going on in the NERS that was focused on this area. Today, I think the majority of reserves have some sort of work going on on blue carbon or interest in beginning their work on blue carbon. And so there really has been an explosion of learning on this topic. So what are the five thematic areas that projects are diving into? One is assessing carbon stocks. The second is quantifying greenhouse gas emissions and carbon sequestration rates. The third is identifying and engaging a suite of partners from the federal, state, and local level to work with reserves on this topic area. Evaluating, the fourth is evaluating carbon market feasibility of projects. And then also the fifth, going the next step of leading demonstration projects to be able to work with partners to um, get projects to market and demonstrate that proof of concept. And so when you look at it, there has really been a, a very diverse array of projects going on. Now, I want to point to the fact that all of these projects have had sort of a guiding focus, I call it. And that guiding focus has been bridging science to management. Um, there hasn't just been a focus on doing the science in these wetland environments to just under better understanding, better scientific understanding, and publish that information and leave that understanding there. But rather, the emphasis has been on how to connect that science to management, to the individuals that need it to make management and policy decisions, to the individuals in which these community members, where these wetland ecosystems um, are and help to build understanding of what's happening in people's communities and in their backyards related to uh, wetland ecosystems. And so this guide and this um, focus on bridging science and management, I think has been powerful contributor to um, what we've learned and how much um, this um, learning has already um, been evident in shaping management and policy decisions. And I'd just like to point, point out a few areas where I see this showing up. The first is in um, greenhouse gas inventories and the fact that these are now beginning to take into consideration more and more the contribution of wetlands. We're seeing it in, in different states and um, it's not just because of the work of the reserve, but the work of the reserve has also played a role. In Massachusetts, where our reserve sits in Rokoit Bay, we've engaged in discussions with policymakers to do exactly this and they're continuing to take that up and in incorporate wetlands management in their 2050 greenhouse gas roadmap and development of climate um, plans. Um, also, speaking of climate change plans and policies, this is another area where we're seeing activity. And as an example of where change has occurred, um, 
in because of the interest, growing interest in tidal restoration as being able to provide a climate mitigation benefit through methane emissions and reducing methane emissions, um, this has um, factored into the development of the 2019 Climate Stewardship Act and has been integrated in that document. It's also been integrated in other guidance documents developed for the EPA, National Academy of Sciences, and also the IPCC Wetland Supplement. So this is an exciting trend that we're seeing, and it's, it's great to watch the science um, being taken and incorporated in these, in these important um, documents and pieces of policy. Um, the third area is in terms of wetlands restoration and conservation. This has been an undergirding theme of all the work. Thinking about the fact that many of our wetlands have been degraded and we're trying to bring those back to a natural state. There's funding necessary to do that. There are collaborations that are necessary to support that. And and, and the fact that this will have huge value to coastal communities and, and for climate mitigation in general. And then also thinking about carbon finance and how that can play a role in incentivizing investment in these types of coastal restoration activity. And not just um, for ecosystems that have been degraded, but for ones that are still intact. For example, the vast peatlands that we find in our sister reserve um, up in Alaska and thinking about um, the contribution of those ecosystems and their importance to salmon fishery, but also to climate mitigation and wanting to protect and preserve them with this understanding. Another interesting area has been the idea of coastal resilience planning and understanding um, that the carbon storage element of these um, tidal wetlands is an important piece in coastal resilience considerations. And then decision maker education and public education has been a huge theme to build that wave of understanding about blue carbon and what it is and what, why it's important to take into consideration and the value of wetlands in the backyards where people live. That's been huge to see that appreciation value sort of go up as people get educated about the topic. And then lastly, in the area of partnerships, so many partnerships have come out of this work and have poured into this work that it's hard to even give individual credit to all the partners in the short time I have today. But just to underscore emphatically that partnerships are a critical piece of this and our partners, partners that we've been working with all over the country are an integral part of, this, of the process and the success that I'm referring to today. Um, I want to spend a, a minute just talking about factors that I think have contributed to that explosion of learning. It's not just the topic that we've been working on and why we worked on it, but also the way in which we've approached the work, the method that we've used, the sort of process experiment to go alongside the learning. And I'd like to just call out a few ingredients that I think are important for success and have contributed. The first is that these projects have addressed end user driven questions. They've also addressed coastal management needs and knowledge gaps. They have all used a collaborative research model, which I think has been a powerful contributor and has revolutionized the way we've done research within the NERS system. This is a model where end users of the science and researchers work together as co-producers, they're looked at as equals in the conversation, they're working together from concept to implementation and being intentional about integrating that knowledge from one side to the next. And I think that that continues today on not just Blue Carbon, but other themes. Other factors for success, they've prioritized end user involvement, um, they've led innovative science, so that's always um, key when you're pushing the envelope of understanding, you're bringing something extra to the table on the scientific um, sort of forefront. Um, they've demonstrated relevance, sought to demonstrate relevance of blue carbon to local communities and to states. Why does it matter? Why should you pay attention to this area? And where does it connect with what you're doing currently in terms of management and policy decisions? They've, they've sought to transfer learning. In fact, there's a culture within the NERS to transfer learning from one reserve to another. What we've learned, what we've explored, bring both the results and the process results to our partners working in other areas of the country. And this NERS Science Collaborative I, deserves an applause for this because they have actually put aside transfer grants, small pots of money to enable reserves to do that transfer of learning. And I think it's helped to catapult that whole um, um, way we learn from each other and, and support it very strongly. Then other things that have factored in is the development of focused tools for the coastal management community. 
um, developing communication products to help transfer what we're learning to different audiences, and then all throughout using and building and recognizing the value of partnerships to the work at large. All of these ingredients, I think, have been factors for success. Some of the challenges have been the fact that funding is always a need to continue both the research and to continue to pour into wetlands restoration. Two, we need more demonstration projects to show proof of concept of blue carbon market projects. We're putting the pieces together and the puzzle is slowly being built and we're almost there, but those demonstration projects are needed to sort of clear the next hurdles. Balancing the necessary lag time that is that occurs between when research is happening in the field and then being able to take from that understanding and, and, and funnel what we're learning into policy and management. There's a necessary gap there, so there's always that push and pull. And the ongoing need for blue carbon education exists and an ongoing need for blue carbon champions that can carry and lead the work in their local regions. Um, lastly, a few lessons that I think from a decade of work. One is that the NERS have really become a great platform for blue carbon research and they can continue to be because they have the right, um, they're in the right places and they have the right kind of people to help to advance the work as we work with partners. Two, it's that using this three-pronged approach of collaborative research approach, um, transfer grants and working with partnerships has been a powerful way by which we've seen that acceleration of, of learning around blue carbon take place. And a word about the market and non-market aspects of blue carbon. On the market side, this has been an innovative way to help people to see and to think about the value of wetlands. But considering that not all wetlands restoration projects will be appropriate or feasible as carbon market projects, it's important to sort of temper the expectations of resource managers and community members, as well as with thinking about how much resources can be generated from the market. Lastly, the non-market side of blue carbon has had powerful benefits. Even if projects don't go to market, just the learning and the accounting of the ecosystem service benefit is large enough, is powerful enough to have a real impact in coastal management and coastal restoration work. And this is where resource managers believe the emphasis should be. So with that whirlwind tour, I just want to thank you for your attention. I hope you've learned some about the work of the reserve system and that you can, where you can find more, I leave you with these links. Hello, my name is Tim Smith. I'm an ecologist with the National Park Service. And today I'm going to talk about the Heron River Project, the Cape Cod National Seashore. I'm going to talk about blue carbon and how we're documenting and quantifying the changes that we expect to occur and how blue carbon is helping to support the, pro the project. So I acknowledge this is a definitely a group effort with a large team of people working on this from multiple agencies. Uh, Heron River is in Wolfleet, Massachusetts out on Albert Cape Cod, narrow part of Cape Cod. The river uh, begins uh, with these, these uh, glacial kettle ponds, runs about four miles through a valley uh, into Wolfie Harbor and Cape Cod Bay. The main problem with the river is this dike that was constructed at the mouth of the river in 1909 as part of a mosquito control project. And the dike is a very effective barrier to tidal flow. On the ocean side, the unrestricted side, Cape Cod Bay, we have about a 10 foot tide range, which is reduced to only about two feet in the river itself because of the dike and this very small set of culverts that um, allow a very limited amount of salt water to pass through there. This has caused a lot of problems in the river over time, uh, really bad water quality issues, changes in vegetation, loss of salt marsh, fish kills, fecal, fecal bacteria, contamination of harvestable shellfish areas, all, all uh, problems with the river that we uh, plant, that we are addressing with the restoration project. The project involves multiple construction elements, multiple culverts and road crossings to restore tide, tide flow to this large area. I'm really going to just focus on the main one, the largest restriction and the largest project at the mouth of the river, which is to replace uh, the existing dike with a, with a bridge structure. So this is a rendering of the new bridge uh, comparison. Um, again, uh, so we have about a six meter wide opening. Currently, that will be replaced by this bridge with about a 50 meter uh, opening wide enough to allow normal natural tide flow. And when this is open, 
we expect about an order of magnitude increase in the area of in, intertidal uh, salt marsh um, habitat from about 28 to 220 or so hectares um, as salinity and tide range is, is reintroduced. And with that will come a pretty dramatic change in vegetation, which is driving a lot of the interest in um, uh, the, these carbon fluxes that we've been measuring and are, are interested in. What we've, we've used the uh, SLAM, the sea level affecting marshes model in a kind of unique, unique way to instead of replicate or simulate sea level rise effects on wetland habitat over a long period of time, we've used the process of tidal restoration in a relatively short term and adapted SLAM to give us some quantification of wetland uh, habitat types changing over about a 25 year time frame. So this is a map uh, showing that we can break it down in a tabular way here and we're seeing under the baseline existing conditions uh, these uh, non-tidal freshwater systems, far, uh, wooded swamp, uh, freshwater wetland, uh, a shrub wetland, and emergent marsh is dominating uh, most of the acreage or area. Uh, and then under two different uh, restoration scenarios, uh, that is replaced by either open water, tidal flat, uh, uh, intertidal habitat, or vegetated uh, intertidal habitat in the future. And these two different scenarios in the future are based on, um, well, the first one is, is strictly the SLAM output without any um, modifications to that, uh, those data that come out of SLAM, and that is projecting uh, pretty large areas of non-vegetated intertidal area because SLAM doesn't, in this, in this application, uh, does not account for accretion or changes in marsh elevation. Um, we expect that not to be the case that you, both through natural accretion processes and through management conducted by the project that we will restore um, those areas to intertidal uh, elevations and be able to support uh, vegetated intertidal habitat. So we've estimated that in the second condition where you can see the majority of uh, restored habitat is, is essentially salt, salt marsh. So working with the uh, Bringing Wetlands to Market project, a carbon market feasibility study was conducted for the Heron River project to look at the feasibility of developing that project into a carbon offset project. Uh, these feasibility studies look at various aspects of carbon um, uh, markets, uh, le legal, financial, organizational um, aspects of, of trying to incorporate that into a project. I'm not gonna talk about any of those. I believe there are other talks within the Ray conference about that. Um, what I'm gonna talk about is the technical feasibility so the actual generation of carbon offsets and how that how that would work. And the basic sort of model here, the, the concept is that by removing these tidal restrictions, we're restoring tide rage and salinity throughout this former estuary, which is driving vegetation changes, and those vegetation changes are driving these uh, carbon fluxes, both in the sense of uh, sequestering or burying carbon in the soil, uh, of avoiding methane emissions into the future, and then also changes in biomass, uh, which have to be accounted for in a full um, a full accounting for uh, the total net carbon uh, changes. So the, the, the basic approach here is to take those acreages that I showed previously and apply uh, a carbon uh, flux factor uh, in existing and future conditions to estimate the net change in, in carbon. So these are the values that were used in the feasibility study. These come both from literature review uh, and also from data collected specifically for at and for the Heron River project. So the, uh, you can see for soil storage, the rates for salt marsh are quite high. For uh, methane emissions, the rates are very low for salt marsh and they're very uh, uh, higher for uh, the freshwater communities. We also are accounting for um, loss of biomass and herbaceous shrub and tree strata. Uh, the um, 
the value here for the biomass value for woody shrub data is based on um, data actually collected at the Heron River. Um, so this is the bottom line accounting here when we have low, mid, and high scenarios based on applying different uh, very different rates of carbon fluxes uh, and the different uh, future scenarios that I talked about. And you can see under this high um, condition, we have a pretty significant uh, net change or net benefit of over 300 million tons of carbon uh, avoided, carbon, carbon dioxide equivalent over the 40 year time, time frame. Um, it's really important to point out that um, the assumptions that went into this were quite conservative. Um, there's a high rate of variability in the literature. To date, we're trying to address that with more site-specific data about the Heron River, which we think will yield generally higher um, rates uh, for both uh, carbon dioxide, burial, and methane emissions. Um, and another important point is this idea of a static baseline that the, our existing condition um, what is happening now in terms of carbon burial and methane emissions is going to stay the same. I'll come back to that in a second, but here's just another way to uh, visualize those results over time um, and looking at this in comparison to some vehicle emissions. You can uh, readily see this is a fairly significant greenhouse gas benefit from the project under the high scenario. So the static baseline idea here um, so you can think of uh, accruing carbon offsets in different ways. And one way, which is this is the way that is used in the feasibility study, is that our existing uh, rates of carbon burial and, emission, and methane emission will stay the same. We think that's really not very realistic and a lot of work now is being done about that. What seems to be more realistic is actually a dynamic baseline where the um, future conditions tend to be more of a global warming potential of a, of a warming effect on the atmosphere. And the, uh, this is driven by sea level rise affecting groundwater, affecting plant succession. So we're beginning to see and starting some, some research and, and data collection on the future condition of vegetation in the Heron River without the restoration project, which our hypothesis is that it's leading to a wetter, and more Phragmites dominated um, existing condition, which would change this baseline so that the difference, the net, the net change compared to um, a changing condition in the future and um, um, avoided methane and higher rates of carbon barrel in the future give us a, net, a greater net benefit and, and a greater uh, greenhouse gas benefit for the project overall. So there's additional work being done to look at this, both from a technical perspective, collecting more data, uh, undertaking some additional research. Um, there's a lot of variables about doing a carbon project that are being looked at. There's um, still work needed about some of the legal um, and, and other um, factors that, that we're looking into, uh, whether this becomes an actual carbon project or not. Um, we're not sure, but we think that, um, integrating blue carbon into a project like this has been really important and really beneficial. It brings in supporters, potential funders, and partners who have an, an interest in the project from a climate change perspective as opposed to a habitat restoration perspective. And when people hear how climate benefits can be incorporated into a tr what traditional habitat restoration project, it, it's very exciting um, becomes a hot, you know, high interest for a certain sector of potential partners and funders. Uh, the data that's been collected have, has been useful for other aspects of the project, other monitoring aspects. So there's a whole host of reasons to uh, make the effort to quantify and recognize blue carbon benefits in a title restoration project. So with that, I want to say thank you. Uh, thanks to Megan for inviting me to the session, for the other, other presenters and for listening and watching the video. Uh, please do get in touch with me if you're interested in more about the Herring River Project um, and Blue Carbon or whatever other aspects. Thank you.
My name is Mattia Jepsen. I am a coastal wetland scientist working at the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. One of the projects I've been working on, along with my coworkers, uh, David Dumont, Julie Bloom, and Helene Barr, is developing a way to strategically identify blue carbon projects in the state. And that's what I'll be talking about with you today. So blue carbon is the stored carbon in marine and coastal systems. Although coastal wetland acreage is less than 1% um, of marine system coverage, they store approximately half of the total carbon sequestered in ocean sediments. One advantage that blue carbon has over carbon sequestration that we typically think of in forests is that the carbon is stored in the soil and the soil is saturated. And the fact that the soil is saturated means that it breaks down very, very slowly. Um, when you compare this to a forest system, the carbon is stored in the tree biomass, which is above ground and exposed to air. As soon as the tree dies, it begins to break down and re-release that carbon to the air. There are nearly 300,000 acres of tidal wetlands in New Jersey. They're a defining feature of our coast. Tidal wetlands are valued for their coastal resiliency benefits as habitat for recreationally and commercially important fish and birds and for their ability to clean water. But now there's a growing appreciation for them as carbon sinks. Within DEP, there are a number of new programs and policies that are interested in these ecosystem services provided by tidal wetlands. So I'll give you some examples of how blue carbon has been popping up in our work and then explain to you how we've begun to quantify the carbon sequestration potential of tidal wetlands in New Jersey. So one way that we that blue carbon has been popping into our work is through the Global Warming Response Act. The Global Warming Response Act establishes greenhouse gas reduction goals for 2020 and for 2050. Uh, as of 2018, we had met our 2020, met and exceeded our 2020 goals for reducing greenhouse um, gas emissions. But the target for 2050 is far more ambitious. And based on some preliminary modeling that has been done for this report, it seems like we can't achieve our 2050 goals without carbon gains from natural sinks. Another example of how we've been running into blue carbon is um, through New Jersey's re-entry into the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, uh, otherwise known as REGI. New Jersey officially rejoined REGI in the January of 2020. REGI is a multi-state market-based program that establishes a regional cap on carbon dioxide emissions, and it requires certain fossil fuel power plants to obtain an allowance for each ton of carbon dioxide that they emit annually. New Jersey gets a percentage of the funds generated from the auction of these allowances. Just in the past six months, New Jersey has earned over $66 million from its participation in REGI, and 10% of that has been slated to go towards carbon sequestration projects, either blue carbon or forestry. Okay, so we want to invest in blue carbon. So how do we do that? Well, we began where all good environmental projects begin with a literature search. We wanted to know what makes a good blue carbon project. What data is out there? If we don't have site-specific data, how can we estimate the net greenhouse gas emissions of tidal wetlands? And then we wanted to take that information and develop some guidelines on how we would identify projects and estimate their benefits. And then finally, we thought that um, if we could develop some interactive web mapping tools, that that would help us to visualize the guidelines that we had developed. So the first thing that we found was that greenhouse gas fluxes in tidal wetlands are complicated, but they're especially complicated in fresh and brackish marshes where the addition of car where in addition to carbon dioxide fluxes, we also need to worry about the production of methane because of the lack of sulfides in the soil and water. Measurements of methane production in fresh and brackish tidal wetlands in the mid-Atlantic are pretty variable. An extra complicating factor is that methane is a far more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, um, but it doesn't last quite as long in the system. System, So we estimate that methane is 25 times more potent over a 100 year time period, or 86 times more potent over a 20 year period than carbon dioxide. So for this reason, 
and based on the literature searches that we did, we are currently using 18 parts per thousand as a default minimum salinity for blue carbon projects. And I'd love to discuss this with you afterwards if you disagree with this approach or have any other suggestions. So based on our literature reviews and discussions with other scientists who work um, with blue carbon, we came up with four basic types of blue carbon projects. First of all, um, the first type would be increasing salinity in impounded or tidally restricted fresh and brackish marshes above um, to increase the salinity above 18 parts per thousand. And this would basically eliminate methane emissions. So in order to do this, for example, here is a state owned marsh where there's a tidal restriction. And this tidal restriction is decreasing the salinity in this area, which has increased the cover of Phragmites and likely increased the methane production. The next type of project would be protecting carbon that's stored in salt marsh soil. Um, and so if we can protect projects from erosion, so for example, this is Gandy's Beach, which is on the Delaware Bay shore of New Jersey. This is a project from the Nature Conservancy. And you can see that um, the historic marsh and beach edge used to be out here in 1939, but it has eroded all the way back to here as of um, 2012. So if we can prevent further erosion, then we can protect all of the carbon that's stored in the soil from um, being re-exposed to oxygen and thus breaking down and being re-emitted into the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas. Um, and the way that we might do that would be through adding um, living shorelines. So at this particular site, the Nature Conservancy added these oyster reef breakwaters. The third type of project would be um, restoring or enhancing salt marshes to increase the cover and productivity of salt marsh vegetation. So for example, this is a large area in the Delaware Bay um, where there used to be vegetation, but now there isn't any salt marsh vegetation. And so this area is no longer sequestering carbon. The fourth type of blue carbon project that we have been considering is the facilitation of salt marsh migration into upland areas as sea level, rise, uh, sea level rises and by removing barriers and protecting future marsh areas from development. So then we took, um, we tried to figure out how we would identify those types of projects through mapping. And we found that we had some layers that might help us to be able to identify those projects. So Julie Bloom and David Dumont put together these um, heat maps, carbon heat maps, and the com this is a combination of marsh migration areas, uh, slam modeling that predicts the likelihood of conversion of marsh to mudflats or open water, areas of impeded tidal flow, the likelihood of edge erosion, the salinity, and the vegetation cover, and that creates these final scores. So we can use this to kind of preliminary preliminarily screen um, projects as they come up. So here finally um, is an example of one of the projects and how we've been. This is the lighthouse camp um, area. It's in the Barnegat Bay. And here we have 1600 feet of tidal wetland shoreline. It's eroding at four feet per year historically. And that equates to a loss of 0.147 acres per year. The salinity is above 18 parts per thousand. And they are planning a living shoreline project here that's um, going through the permitting process right now. So in order to calculate the benefit of this project, <clears throat> we used our literature searches to come up with some standard um, rates and carbon densities. So first we calculate what would happen to the um, net carbon balance at the site without the project. And to do that, we looked at the number of acres that would be lost based on our erosion rates um, over a 20-year period, a 30-year period, and an 80-year period. And then we would look at the amount of um, the lost carbon sequestration potential of those areas because those um, acres of marsh are currently vegetated. So if, you, if they erode away, they're no longer vegetated and no longer sequestering new carbon. And so we took a standard rate, and if you multiply that by the number of acres, you can get the um, metric tons of carbon per acre per year. Um, then we also had to look at what happens to the carbon that is in the soil that gets eroded. We used a standard rate of 
um, that 4.3% of the carbon stock would be eroded or would be um, lost back to the atmosphere annually. And then we have our average amount of carbon that's stored in a, um, in a, uh, per acre at a one meter depth. And so then as the soil erodes, we can take 4.3% of that per year and come up with some estimates of the emissions that would be created by the loss of that shoreline. If you add these together, you get your net carbon storage. So we have a negative carbon storage without the project. If we add the project, we um, no longer are losing this area of marsh. So we can, we don't have to worry about this loss anymore. And in addition, they're adding 2.4 acres. And so then we can calculate the metric tons of carbon per acre per year um, to come up with some estimates of the additional storage. So if we add the amount of additional storage to the um, to what would have been lost without the project, then we can get our total project benefits here on the second. And so we went through this exercise for four different restoration project types. Um, and this gives us a nice way to be able to compare across projects. Another way to compare across projects is to look at the project um, benefit. So we looked at the cost per metric ton of carbon dioxide sequestered. And to do that, we just take the total project cost and divide it by the metric tons of carbon dioxide sequestered. So our next steps are to, as I said, improve the estimates using more local data. We're working with NRCS to get more blue carbon samples across our tidal wetlands and to develop some blue carbon estimates for the 2050 greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals and to integrate the Duke and DEP blue carbon mapping into our coastal ecological restoration and adaptation plan. So thank you very much for your time. And um, I would please contact me if you have any questions or comments. Thank you. Hello, my name is Megan Eagle. I'm presenting today um, for Jim Holmquist, a collaborative project assessing impounded coastal wetland area um, in the continental US. Um, this work was helped along by two interns, Rebecca Lee at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center and Leanna Stackwitz at USGS, uh, working with Kevin, Sydney, and myself. Um, so we've heard a lot today about the climate benefits of uh, coastal wetland restoration, and that potential lies um, in two main areas, and that is the transition from fresh impounded to marine um, uh, natural hydrology when there is a change in hydraulic management of a wetland system that's impounded um, that reduces methane up the emissions of potent greenhouse gases. It also, um, when you restore hydrology, it returns the um, natural feedback between uh, sea level and the marsh platform. Um, and this feedback has been shown to result in increased carbon capture as wetlands respond to sea level rise. Now the key to understanding um, the management potential of these restoration actions is really knowing what wetland area that we're talking about. And how we get to that is by looking at maps of wetlands. Um, of course, if you're going to look at wetland maps, you start with a national wetland inventory. And this consists of um, wetland areas that have been identified um, in a variety of classes um, and subclasses. Um, here are some NWI uh, codes. Um, and what we're interested in is areas, coastal wetland areas that are coded with a modifier of diked and impounded. Um, and so uh, you, when you map areas, um, you, you get these classifications. And we wanted to understand, are these classifications um, accurate and it, are there any potential undermapped or overmapped um, uh, areas in the NWI specifically with regard to diked and impounded coastal wetlands? And one reason we think that there might be some discrepancies in NWI um, is by looking at a few examples. So here I'm taking you to Heron River, which by now you know quite a bit about. Um, this is definitely an impounded wetland in Massachusetts. And you'll see there are none of the H qualifiers that NWI uses to indicate this is an impounded wetland. So this is an example of an omission from NWI. 
um, all take next to California. And this wetland you can see has those little H qualifiers. And this is because it was an impounded wetland but has since gone, undergone restoration. And so now there are areas that aren't impounded but really are restored um, that are continued to be marked as impounded. Um, due to uh, these and other discrepancies, we wanted to do an assessment of how accurate that impounded classification was. So Jim combined the National Wetlands Inventory of Vegetation classes, as well as an elevation map that took into account the land surface elevation and the water level at that site, and then mapped out the areas that should be intertidal and overlaid them. Um, we then overlaid that with the protected areas database and that was because for an expert elicitation we need to be able to identify who the landowner and manager is to query them. Um, they, we determined that we needed 450 points um, in our survey and that consisted of the majority of non-impounded wetlands. Um, and we had 85 impounded sites that were classified under NWI as well as 85 um, non-wetland sites. For the actual survey, you can see it spread across the entire uh, continental US um, along the west, east, and gulf coasts. So each of those pink dots represents a site where somebody um, was asked about wetland status. The actual initial survey um, was sent to uh, somebody who was identified who might be able to give us their expert um, knowledge of the system and they were given a point and then they were asked, which is this little square here, um, is this an impounded diked wetland or water? Is it non-impounded dike, non-diked wetland or water? Or is it not a wetland or water at all? Um, and then they asked, over the past 40 years, has there been a transition in the above category? Um, we then took the responses on, and compared them to the actual mapped data. So that's how that expert elicitation worked. Um, we got a great response, 439 of the 450 initial points had questions, and overall NWI is, is very accurate, um, which is great to know. Um, however, when we look at this a little more closely, we can actually see there are some places where NWI isn't as accurate. And so what this graph is showing is a ratio of the points um, that the experts identified in one category versus what NWI classifies them as. And so you can see the expert identified many more points as impounded than actually were um, classified as impounded in NWI. And this represents an undermapping of impounded wetlands um, in the NWI database. And we can then take that ratio of what it should be um, or what NWI classifies as impounded to what uh, the experts say exists. And we can then correct the NWI area. And what that looks like um, is here. So the gray represents the mapped area currently on, in CONUS of impounded wetlands, with the um, orange being a new estimate of impounded wetland area. And Rebecca had um, a great way to demonstrate that those 480 hectares that aren't mapped is roughly the size of Rhode Island. And I'd like to note Rhode Island is where we would be if we weren't in a pandemic. Um, so what do those non-impounded wetlands uh, and mapping mismatches look like? So this is a site in North Carolina that um, is classified as a non-impounded wetland, but is actually impounded. Um, and this is a site in California that's mapped as a non-wetland, but is actually a restored impounded wetland. Um, and there's what it looks like. Um, we did a follow-on survey with four specifically the impounded sites that were identified in the first survey. And the goal of this survey was to understand what the salinity class was, what the degree of impoundment was, and then what the reason was for the impoundment. And the reason we did this follow-on survey is many of the climate benefits of restora hydraulic restoration um, are linked to that methane um, uh, cycle, which, res which is typically uh, decreases with increasing salinity, um, as well as that connection to the ocean. Um, and so our responses from that follow-up expert elicitation um, gave us some more information to look at, you know, what, what are those impounded wetlands um, and what could they potentially be? So this graph is looking at the change in salinity um, that the experts predicted would occur if the area was impounded. So anything that's a square is a point that would not change salinity class upon impoundment. 
And any um, symbol that has a green arrow is a site that they predict would get saltier, whereas anything with a red arrow is a site that they would predict um, would get fresher. And so you can see there's a large number of fresh wetlands that are impounded that would not change their salinity class. And a lot of this is due to a large number of our sites being in the Gulf Coast and Louisiana, where there's a significant amount of tidal freshwater wetland. However, about 25% of the restored sites would have an increase in salinity. Um, the vast majority of the sites um, that were impounded either fully or partially blocked tidal exchange. However, there are some areas where experts identified um, that the connecting waters to be non-tidal. Um, and uh, there were even a few that said, yep, uh, tidal exchange is still occurring despite it being impounded. Um, and then what, what was the reason for the impoundment? Um, and you can see the vast majority of responses indicate that it was a purposeful management decision. Um, very, um, uh, then there was also some that noted that it was in incidental, which occurs um, during, for instance, the construction of a road or railway. And that other category is a bit interesting, um, and it's where people were able to give a little bit more information. And that varied across uh, region. You can see um, some of the uh, explanations um, given for that other category um, across the Gulf West and East Coast here, being everything from timber harvest to restoration to conservation of um, endangered species populations. So our take home meshes, messages are that impounded wetlands are undermapped in NWI. Um, and uh, across the continental US, there's probably around 500,000 hectares of impounded wetlands. 25% um, of those in the survey um, would be projected to get saltier upon hydrologic restoration. And finally, I want to put a plug in for the interns who really put in a lot of hours um, for the expert elicitation, including the, the second one, which happened in our post COVID world, um, took a lot of calling and emails. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kevin Kroger, and I'm the lead of the Environmental Geoscience Group at the USGS Woods Hole Coastal and Marine Science Center. During the past 10 years, our group has been studying carbon cycling and greenhouse gas cycling in coastal ecosystems, including research to inform implementation of blue carbon. As has been noted, an intact and well-functioning salt marsh is an important carbon sink, building soil carbon stocks and storing them for centuries to millennia. But our opportunity to manage greenhouse gases at the coast goes beyond carbon stocks. As an example, in the top left of this map, we have a freshwater impoundment behind a roadway. Those kinds of ecosystems tend to have enhanced methane emissions and diminished soil carbon sequestration. They're non-resilient to sea level rise and the roadway is a barrier to migration. Um, in the middle, we have a couple of examples of diked fresh impoundments. Those are similar to the, the roadway impoundment. And on the bottom, we have a couple of examples of drained uh, former tidal wetland um, behind um, roads and agricultural berms. These kinds of uh, drained wetlands tend to have high rates of CO2 emission in the early decades, followed by diminished soil carbon uh, sequestration and um, um, they are also non-resilient to sea level rise. Um, we've estimated previously this, that a substantial portion of U.S. tidal wetlands have managed hydrology. Improving conditions in these settings is our best opportunity for greenhouse gas management at the coast. To make effective use of this opportunity, we need three things. We need functional maps, new functional maps that indicate wetland management condition and, and carbon processes. We need improved predictions of methane and carbon dioxide processes in impaired wetlands. And we need model predictions of change in response to sea level rise and management actions. And in the rest of this talk, I'll focus mostly on that third item. Um, to give a better idea of um, carbon and greenhouse gas cycling in, in wetlands with managed hydrology, here we have diagrams indicating on the top left a natural intact salt marsh. Um, because of routine uh, water exchange with the coastal ocean, 
this kind of ecosystem has abundant supply of sulfate ion, which uh, tends to inhibit methane emission. Um, a natural uh, salt marsh will um, have a high rate of net carbon dioxide uptake, uh, building increasing soil carbon stocks and gaining elevation in response to sea level rise. And they will uh, typically have a negative climatic forcing, meaning they cool the climate. In the top right, we have an impounded uh, former tidal wetland. Often these ecosystems will um, become freshened due to runoff of fresh water from the landscape. Um, the blockage of uh, tidal exchange means that sulfate ion is in limited supply, and these kinds of ecosystems will therefore have a higher rate of methane emission. They'll often also um, have a, a smaller rate of net soil carbon storage. Um, meaning that they don't gain elevation um, uh, as well as a natural ecosystem does. And on the whole, they will tend to be a, a climate warmer. On the bottom right, we have an example of a, a drained uh, salt marsh. This uh, kind of drained wetland um, will tend to be a uh, substantial carbon dioxide source to the atmosphere because um, uh, soil carbon stocks are exposed to um, oxygen from the atmosphere um, because of the, the drainage of the pore spaces. And um, that loss of organic matter will drive a loss of elevation as well. This kind of ecosystem will tend to be a climate warmer. So on the bottom left, we have some um, calculations of um, radiative forcing, um, meaning the impact on the global climate of management of this kind of an ecosystem. And what it shows is that um, drained and impounded wetlands um, have a large positive radiative forcing, me meaning that they warm the climate much larger than the negative radiative forcing that we get with an intact uh, tidal wetland ecosystem. So what this means is that on a per unit area basis and collectively, we have a substantial opportunity for greenhouse gas management in these kinds of uh, hydrologically altered uh, tidal wetlands. The planned restoration at Herring River is a prime example of tidal restoration as a carbon project and is serving as a site for testing and improving ideas and methods. A century ago, the main dike was installed at the mouth, substantially blocking tidal flows and causing both drainage and impoundment. This map shows that the former salt marsh is now wood or shrubland, indicating drainage, or fresh to brackish wetland, indicating impoundment. We've calculated substantial emissions during the past century as a result of this diking and are now collecting data on carbon stocks and fluxes in vegetation, soil, gas exchange, and water fluxes to quantify the current greenhouse gas budget. The current draft of the carbon market analysis indicates that climate change mitigation benefits are likely based on an assumption of a static baseline. In other words, an assumption that carbon processes today would remain the same throughout this century while restoration would result in net emissions reduction. Our new thinking though is that emissions will increase in the coming decades, meaning that the benefit of restoration will be larger than currently estimated. To understand why it helps to look at the hydrology of diked wetlands. Under natural conditions, tide range controls the distribution of uh, intertidal salt marsh. The uh, fresh groundwater lens uh, underneath the upland landscape uh, has an elevation controlled by the sea level and the distribution of upland vegetation is largely controlled by the depth of the water table. With installation of a dike, the water table is, is uh, lowered within the, uh, the intertidal ecosystem. The sea is held back by the dike and flapper gates allow drainage of water off of the landscape. Uh, the lower water table in the uh, former salt marsh allows upland vegetation, including trees and shrubs and um, terrestrial grasses to grow in the formal, uh, former uh, salt marsh. So, what do the current conditions mean for the future of Herring River and other diked wetlands? 
given their initial low intertidal elevation followed by subsidence and muted elevation gain, these upland forest and shrub ecosystems have extremely shallow uh, water tables. We suggest that decreasing depth to groundwater driven by sea level rise will be a predictive driver of ecosystem change, leading to succession from upland to freshwater uh, wetland land covers. Consequences for greenhouse gas budgets will be substantial. There will be tree mortality and respiration of woody biomass, enhanced methane emissions, and increased soil carbon storage. These next slides give a, a visual indication of, of the concept we're, we're describing. So currently Herring River is a subsided landscape with a mix of upland and low salinity wetland. Um, there's already widespread mortality of, of trees, which um, may be an indicator of rising groundwater due to sea level rise. Um, with a sea level rise scenario of one meter during the 21st century, groundwater will become shallow enough to drive widespread vegetation transitions prior to mid-century. Um, during the second half of the century, groundwater levels are expected to be at or above soil elevation throughout uh, the former salt marsh areas, uh, resulting in freshwater impounded uh, wetland. A preliminary analysis suggests substantial carbon cycle changes as a result, including mortality of woody vegetation, enhanced rate of soil carbon storage, and enhanced methane emissions in expanded area of freshwater wetland. Therefore, the climatic cooling due to restoration, shown here as a negative radiative forcing, is several fold greater than would be estimated with an assumed static baseline. These results suggest that impounded and drained wetlands present uh, an excellent opportunity for greenhouse gas management in coastal ecosystems. Um, information and data needs for implementation of this form of blue carbon include maps of drained and impounded land in the potential intertidal portion of the landscape, emission factors for each land cover type and activity, predicted change with project and without project based on sea level rise, response in the terrestrial hydrology and interaction with human infrastructure, and tracking of changes in emissions under baseline and with project scenarios. Future baseline predictions can make a critical difference and mitigation benefits are greater than would be predicted uh, by stocks and stock change alone. Critically, reduced methane emissions uh, provide a rapid and perma permanent uh, climate change mitigation. I'd like to make these acknowledgements. Uh, thank you for listening and feel free to make contact if you'd like to discuss further. Thank you for attending our session um, and welcome to the Q&A part. Um, the rest of the panel will be showing up shortly. If you have any questions, um, we ask that you type them into the question box at the right um, and then um, we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, I think I'll I'll start um, since we have almost the full panel here. Um, the first question, Tana, is for you. And it's um, really about uh, what states are at the forefront of blue carbon research. Obviously, um, you discussed Massachusetts and Matias from New Jersey, so we know those states are. Um, and what progress has been made, um, including blue carbon into state inventories and specifically regarding setting um, emissions targets? Okay, um, so I can speak um, most directly about Massachusetts. I know that for other states where, and, I, and my presentation was focused largely on what's happening within, within the research reserve system. So I can speak to the fact that um, our partners out in Padilla Bay and in South Sioux Reserve um, in the Pacific Northwest, they're working a lot um, with um, decision makers there um, in Alaska and Kachemak Bay, um, down in the Gulf of Mexico region and suite of reserves there, and then um, us over in New England. So people are at different stages of having that conversation with their states. Um, in Massachusetts, um, 
this has progressed in like two different ways. When we first started our first phase of the Bring Your Wetlands to Market project and we engaged with policymakers there, they really wanted to sort of know, um, so so tell us how much can we, what can we factor into our climate action plan? They were doing a climate action plan then. And we got to the stage where they at least qualitatively recognized greenhouse gas, um, you know, uh, benefits from uh, from natural lands. And that was written in. Um, this stage, we're doing a, an update, doing a 2050 um, greenhouse gas roadmap. And um, we're, we've started those conversations with them again. And now we brought into 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 that conversation the element of benefits from methane emissions from, from restoring tidal wetlands, which wasn't a part of the conversation. And so they're they are um, factoring that in. They're looking at different wetlands management strategies and what can be realistically accomplished, enforced, and written into their road their, their roadmap. Um, so that's just an example of how those conversations have progressed over time into taking into take it into consideration what we're learning from the science real time. And um, and the policymakers digesting that information and then trying to figure out concretely how to put that into their plans. I know that there are other states outside um, of those working with with specific reserves that are doing um, this greenhouse gas um, inventory and update. I think Mathea spoke to what they're doing in New Jersey, and then there are others also. I think Kevin can contribute here for some of the um, the projects that may be happening with with um, collaborators like at Duke looking at looking at their climate action plans. I don't know if you can, Kevin. I can't say a lot about the, the Duke project uh, in terms of their communications with the states yet, mm -hmm. although Katie Warnell did did tell us something about that this morning in her presentation. I thought their progress in New Jersey is extremely encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to note um, that the presentation that was loaded um, by Tim, Tim was giving two talks during the summit and they loaded the same talk twice. And so you didn't get to see the blue carbon aspects of the Herring River. Tim, did you wanna just do a one minute highlight reel? Um, mm -hmm. Oh, I think you're muted. Uh, yeah, um, thank you, Megan. I'm sorry uh, for the glitch there. Maybe uh, in the version that gets preserved for the future, it can be fixed. But um, fortunately, Kevin kind of got to the punchline of what I had to say. Um, my talk was more how we got to the punchline, um, the, the, the take home as far as the quantification of um, carbon benefits based on vegetation change being driven by reintroduction of saline water. Um, we used uh, output from a modified flam model to predict or project that vegetation change, linked to a hydrodynamic model. So we have a salinity component in there. Um, used a variety of uh, carbon factors, both from data collected by folks on this group and from published sources to um, produce that, that outcome. So hopefully, there'll be a chance for folks to track that down if they care to. So the next question is for the whole panel and it was asked, what policy change do you think would um, most drastically uh, change implementation of blue carbon um, policies? Well, I can take a little bit of a stab at that. Um, certainly, uh, you know, as a national park unit, um, you know, we've done this background work to look at, you know, quantifying potential benefits, but realizing those benefits, we're not quite sure um, how that might work out. There is no, at least Department of Interior policy for for how this can happen. So I think a change in federal policy that would uh, facilitate a realization of those benefits would be a huge factor given the uh, prevalence of wetlands within federal uh, you know, national parks, wildlife refuges, and other lands. Mm -hmm. Matia, there was a question about your assumption that the buried carbon was lost um, due to sea level rise conversion. Um, can you? One of the questions was asked is, wouldn't the carbon continue to be stored um, as it uh, reverts to subtitle? So, do you want to address uh, that? How you dealt with that assumption? Sure. Actually, we weren't um, 
I think that has been a, a common issue um, that, that people have been looking at for these types of projects, but we weren't actually looking at areas that would be lost due to sea level rise. We were looking at areas that would be lost due to erosion. And then we were looking at the loss of the um, carbon that would be stored by the vegetation, as well as what would be emitted from the eroded soils. So just looking at what the, you know, we look, took historic rates of erosion and then projected them out. Thanks. Kevin, there was a question about Phragmites. So you portray Phragmites as um, a net emitter um, because of the balance between methane and um, carbon. Can you discuss more of that? Because that um, isn't necessarily common or uh, across all coastal wetlands with Phragmites. Mm. Yeah. So Phragmites can uh, grow and, and persist at, at um, pretty high salinity in some cases. So it's not specifically the presence of the Phragmites that we're uh, pointing to, but rather the presence of low salinity conditions. So the, the lack of uh, seawater uh, exchange with tides uh, means there's less sulfate supply from the seawater and, and therefore more methane emissions. Um, Phragmites is very productive. It does take up a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, Megan's been doing a lot of uh, data collections in the soils underneath the, the Phragmites and other kinds of vegetation to determine um, what those rates are. Uh, I can say that um, if there are significant, if an ecosystem, a wetland ecosystem is a significant methane emitter, it's very likely that that methane emission will significantly outweigh the, the carbon storage in the soil in terms of climate impact. Great. So um, one question is, how would you respond to one of the obstacles we face for when trying to connect um, or reconnect impounded wetlands to the tide? Um, once these areas have become fresh wetlands, there is some pressure to maintain them as such, especially if they're perceived to be high quality freshwater wetlands. Yeah, that's that's a great point. I mean, I I've been thinking about this a good bit recently. I think part of the reason that we value um, these freshwater impoundments that are in the intertidal space in areas that would otherwise be a saline intertidal wetland is because we've drained and developed our freshwater wetlands. And so we have limited habitat for the migratory birds and these unnatural impoundments um in the uh, uh, intertidal space um, become extremely valuable as habitat so i think you know partly related to the question about um policy previously as well um we need to think about the landscape a little bit more comprehensively and if we want to have space for um for migration of saline wetlands and restoration of saline wetlands then we need to uh, maintain and restore the freshwater wetlands landward of those at the same time. Tony, did you want to add to that? Yeah, just briefly that I think that there's also like a role um, for for building community appreciation and understanding of how these different wetland types are functioning. Um, because I think that that, um, that contributes to how the public views um, the, and, and how policymakers view these systems as well. And so it, that can actually have a large role. And we've seen that transition happen, um, at least speaking from my involvement in bringing wetlands to market project and, and that community appreciation and understanding piece, which I think can, can be huge in these types of conversations. This question is for Mattia. It says, with regards to the carbon um, sequestration heat maps, how were the variables included determined and what data sets um, did you include? Did you pull them together or did you gather them from regional and national sources? Let's see, so the, the data maps, um, we have some of the layers were New Jersey specific. We pulled from any, basically we, we came up with a sort of a wish list of the types of layers that we might want and then we um, added in, you know, anything that we thought we, we could. Um, we used some, uh, the SLAM map mapping to predict areas. So our, our, the SLAM mapping in New Jersey includes both vulnerability to sea level rise as well as predicted areas of erosion. Um, and then 
we use um, the, for, in terms of our um, carbon storage rates, we looked at both uh, very like site specific places where we had um, rates of carbon storage and carbon density estimates. And then we compared that to regional estimates and national estimates and found that the estimates from across New Jersey um, sort of, th that the national estimates um, were kind of central, like a center, central number. Um, and so we ended up using national national numbers and that made it easier to, to be able to create those layers. Um, and I'm happy to send, you know, a greater description of those layers if anyone would like them. Um, so the next question I'll hit is, um, how do you recommend we get help with NWI maps updated um, to better reflect the extent of impoundment and title restriction? And I'll just say this is an area of active um, research and publishing. Um, Jim Holmquist has is, is, is got some uh, papers and products um, in, in the works that will helpfully address this, um, looking at how we can get at uh, ex, you know, better area estimates of impounded wetlands based on some of the work that you saw here, as well as some other geographical analyses. Um, but NWI does continue to be updated um, as well. Uh, so anybody wanted to add to that? Okay, and there was another question about what are potential best management practices for considering blue carbon projects as um, salt marshes migrate upstream? Um, and it, particularly taking into account um, not just the erosion at the bank side, but also the carbon dynamics as they move through ghost forests. So is the question about carbon budgets as that occurs, or is it, is it more about policy? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's about both. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, there's going to be a lot of carbon lost as that as that forest decays. Um, you know, I don't think that that you know, it's. I, I guess I would maybe ask Matea, uh, how would that appear in a carbon budget within the greenhouse gas accounting at the state level? I don't think a natural process like that with an emission due to um, tree mortality under natural processes would appear as an emission in your in your um, inventory? Yeah, we don't have, I, we haven't looked at, I haven't looked at trees in any of the projects yet and their mortality and the emission from those trees. Um, but, but I think I would attempt to calculate that, you know, so if you were trying to decide whether to put your money into building a living shoreline project to protect carbon the carbon rich soils from eroding or if you're trying to put your money into buying land um you know if we're in marsh migration zones i, I think i would want to take a look at the you know the carb the carbon losses from the trees in that calculation as well as the edge erosion um, and take a look at whether rates of carbon storage seem to be higher in established marshes or in newly farm newly forming marshes Plus, I would also think that in the in that transitional border, there's probably some. It's probably fresher. You end up often having a lot of phragmites in that area. So I wonder if you would end up having methane emissions because that area would actually have a lower salinity, at least initially. I think we have to close out because we're getting the we're done symbol. Um, thank you guys so much for um, the great questions. We didn't get all to all of them, and enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all.